This section is going to have a look at catalysts and how they affect the rate of reaction. A catalyst is something that speeds up the rate of reaction without being used up. This example of a catalyst is going to have a look at the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, naturally decomposes into water and oxygen. So if I start off with 10 mL of hydrogen peroxide and pop it into a test tube, you won't be able to see that much happening. However, over time this will break down and you will see bubbles forming as you can start to see in there of oxygen. However, if I use a catalyst, so I've got three options here of manganese, copper and zinc oxide, we should be able to see a different reaction, bearing in mind that what we start off with in the catalyst we should end up with. So in this case I'm going to put in 0.5 grams. So if I take 0.5 grams of zinc oxide and add it into my 10 mil of hydrogen peroxide, you can straight away see bubbles starting to form. This shows that a chemical reaction has occurred and it has sped up the rate of decomposition. If I do the same with copper oxide, very little happens. You will still be able to see some bubbles forming in there though. So out of the two you would say that zinc oxide is the better one. But you can definitely see bubbles of oxygen forming. And finally if I do the same with manganese oxide, you can see straight away loads of gas being given off, loads of oxygen. So you could say that manganese oxide is the best catalyst out of the three. The last bit is how do you prove that none of the catalyst has been used up using, during the reaction. To do that, you need to put your filter paper and pre-weigh it. So my filter paper weighs 1.23 grams. The next thing you need to do is choose one of your samples. So I'll go with the copper oxide and filter it. So take your copper oxide and tip it into your filter paper. You'll need to rinse it through with distilled water to make sure you get all of your solid through. You. Once you've done that, you need to let it filter through and collect all the solid remaining. You should then be left with a clear solution at the bottom and your copper oxide in here. You now need to leave that to dry. So you place the filter paper, once it's dried, back onto the scales and you'll see it should have gone up by about 0.5 grams, which is the mass of the filter paper. So in this case we've gone up by 0.51, there's probably just a little bit of damp left in there. That shows that none of the catalyst has been used up, however it sped up the rate of reaction. Normally, a chemical reaction occurs when two particles bump into each other. If they have enough energy, a reaction will occur. However, in some cases, this takes time, and what we want to do in industry is to reduce as much time as possible, which is why we increase the temperature, concentration, and surface area. The other thing that we can do is use a catalyst. What that does is it provides another route for the reaction to occur. So instead of two particles just bouncing into each other, think of it like this. So in this example here, we have two reactants. This reaction can still occur at a low temperature, low concentration and low surface area, provided a catalyst is being used. The catalyst takes these two reactants and gives them another path to react. As you can see here, the product has been formed and the catalyst has remained exactly the same.
If we look back to energy diagrams, remember energy is needed for any reaction to occur. This is an endothermic process. And this is your activation energy, the energy required for any reaction to occur. And then afterwards you have your products forming, which can either be endo or exothermic. What a catalyst does is it lowers that activation energy, the energy required for a reaction to occur. So this is the energy required without a catalyst. And the red line is the energy required with a catalyst. So if there is less energy required, the collisions are more successful. So it will mean even some of the collisions that hit each other with less energy will still react to form our products. If you combine this with temperature, surface area and concentration, you can speed up a lot of reactions quite quickly. A key example of where catalysts are used is in catalytic converters in cars inside the exhaust system. Without a catalytic converter, when combustion inside the engine occurs, gases such as carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide can be produced. Sulfur dioxide can lead to acid rain and carbon monoxide is poisonous. So what they do is they use a catalyst. Now this can be either palladium, rhodium, platinum or a mixture of the three. Because these metals are quite expensive, what they do is they crush the metals up into a powder and coat the inside of the catalytic converter with it. This means that it has a larger surface area for the catalyst to react with the carbon monoxide. The actual size of the inside of a catalytic converter, when they take into account the honeycomb shape, is about three football pitches. Now when you look on the outside, it's only about the size of a shoebox. But because of the internal design, the way the scientists have made it, three football pitches worth of platinum can be in there, which means as many chemical reactions as possible can occur. The final thing you need to know is that catalysts, or well, in the catalytic converter, work really well, but sometimes they take a bit of time to get going. That's because it takes time for the car engine to warm up. As the car engine warms up, it's the same with your rate of reaction with temperature. The temperature gets higher, the particles get more energy. The more energy they have, the more collisions, the more reactions that occur. So this carbon monoxide that comes through here reacts with more oxygen. Let's turn it back into carbon dioxide, which is your safe byproduct.